Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Bob Spitz. A longtime musician, Mr. Spitz managed Bruce Springsteen and Elton John before retiring from the music business in 1980 to pursue his love of writing. He has written seven books, including Barefoot in Babylon, an eye-opening documentary of the Woodstock Music Festival, and The Beatles, his definitive best-selling biography of the supergroup. His pieces have been featured in the New York Times Magazine, The Washington Post, Esquire, GQ, and Rolling Stone, among many others. In Deary, Bob Spitz tells the story of how Julia Child took on all the pretensions of French cooking and became an iconic figure, touching off the food revolution that has gripped America for more than 50 years. According to Newsday, Spitz gives us plenty of the wacky one-liners that endeared Child to her television audience and a warm, nuanced portrait. But his bigger achievement is in setting her career against the most significant movements of the 20th century, from McCarthyism to the sexual revolution to the greening of America. He reveals how she helped redefine domesticity in the media age, transforming the way we cook, eat, and even think about food. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Bob Spitz. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming out tonight. I have to tell you that last week, uh, I was in uh, Pasadena on, uh, on Wednesday night, Julia's hometown, and I was up against Bill Clinton at a bookstore. <laughs> and uh, in Santa Barbara, where uh, Julia spent the last remaining years, on Thursday night, up against uh, President Obama, uh, and I checked the paper tonight. I think there's a rerun of Law and Order. So, um, uh, and, and I guess if I can't get an audience in this town, I, I can't draw, draw an audience anywhere. Um, so there I was in Italy in 1992, um, doing not much of anything. What the Italians called il dolce far niente. Uh, it's not exactly true. Um, I was on assignment for about a half dozen magazines uh, in, in Sicily. And I got a call from a friend who was at the Italian Trade Commission. Uh, would you mind being an escort for an older woman, she asked. I thought, lady, I don't do that kind of work. <laughs> she said, it's too bad. It, it's Julia Child. And I said, I'll be right over. <laughs> and that, friends, is the Cliff's Note version, a Cliff Notes version of how I came to write this book, Deary. Julia simply... She walked into my life a stone's throw from the main piazza in Tormina, and my days as an amateur escort took an unpredictable turn. I was 42, she was 82. I was six feet tall, she was much taller. <laughs> she called me Deary. It wasn't until later that I found out, as you all know, Julia called everybody Deary, including the local beggars and the feral town dog. But ladies and gentlemen, let me assure you, for the next three and a half weeks, I was basking in Julia Child's company. My younger, shorter heart self did backflips. Yes, yes, I was in thrall as we crisscrossed Sicily together, um, eating and talking, eating a lot of Italian food, and talking about eating Italian food. Don't worry, food was Julia's passion. Not me, not Deary. But that passion, a passion unlike any I had experienced before, gave me a platform onto a very remarkable woman. There's so much to talk about in Julia's long life, but tonight I wanted to focus on her extraordinary transformation, a transformation that mirrored the evolving role of women in America during her lifetime. And I want to talk about how, by following her passions and dreams through that transformation, and driving her natural talents to the utmost limits, she managed to transform not only herself, but our entire culture. I, I want to talk about how Julia Child transformed the way we eat, and of course, the way we live. Julia was remarkable in so many ways. Let's forget for a moment that she wrote one of the greatest culinary treatises of all times. And let's forget, too, that she became one of the most beloved television personalities on par with Johnny Carson, Oprah, and Kermit the Frog. The remarkable woman that I'm talking about, it, it's the Julia Child who at the age of 40, bereft of direction, confidence, know-how, a palate, and the ability to conjugate even the simplest of French verbs, no more than a dilettante or in her words, 
a social butterfly, she took a huge gamble. She leaped off a cliff and she found everything that she was looking for in life, and especially in herself. Now, today in the iPod age, I don't think that's such a hard transformation to pull off. Sure, of course, Title IX hardly offers a crumb, and the glass ceiling is all but shatterproof. But with a little moxie and some technological elbow grease, I think it's possible for a, a modern woman of a certain age to, to reinvent herself. Just ask Hillary Clinton. But in 1960, when womanhood was emerging from the Pleistocene era, it was no small feat. Julia Child, who even her husband considered an empty vessel, began filling up the tank. This was a woman ready to devour the world. At the age of 30, she left the safety of her country for a life overseas. She married a man that her father considered the handmaid to Satan, an intellectual, an artist, and worse, a liberal Democrat, a man whose sophistication and erudition gave Julia something to shoot for. She discovered her voice, not that voice. We'll get to that later. And sex, which we won't get to later, thank you very much, although um, we, we do in the book. <laughs> she learned how to be independent, how not to compromise her beliefs. She began reading everything that she could get her hands on. Philosophy, history, political theory, literature, poetry, all the stuff that she should have studied at Smith College where she majored in carousing. <laughs> she discovered food, not the sheetrock that her mother used to serve, but the kind of food whose description alone made her salivate like a St. Bernard, and cooking. And once Julia Child learned how to cook, and not just cook, but how to make the finest, most delicious meals using the freshest ingredients and technique that was older than the ages, she came into her own. Julia Child arrived. That, in a word, is remarkable as far as I'm concerned. One might believe that Julia came from humble beginnings, but you know that the opposite is true. She grew up in a house just off Millionaire's Row in Pasadena, where her father was one of the town's leading lights. She was pretty well pampered in a household with cooks, maids, and butlers, and educated at a Tony West Coast boarding school. Her orbit was one of gilded country clubs, gated beach enclaves, and polo matches, all of which she loved but somehow failed to motivate her. Uh, Self-discovery is easy for a young woman of, say, 25. I think we all learn who we are and the paths our life will take about that point in our life. By 30, however, Julia was still a lost soul, that social butterfly. And after college, there was no meaningful role intended for her but marriage. It's really funny. Of all the women in her class, I'll just deviate for a second, who graduated from Smith College, I looked, and there was 92% of them, I took that little chunk out, um, half of them got married. And the other half, they went to the Catherine Gibbs Secretarial School. This from Smith College, and Julia wasn't having any of it. Uh, after college, she didn't want to get married, but Julia was unlucky in love. Her only beau, a two-timer named Tom Johnston, ditched her unceremoniously. Alas, she was too tall to get other dates. And a longtime suitor, the man her father had picked out for her, Harrison Chandler, the heir to the Los Angeles Times dynasty, wasn't dynamic enough. Julia found him too boring to fulfill her conception of what a fully engaged partner should be. This was a woman way ahead of her time. So she did what any woman would do at that point in her life. She ran off and she joined the OSS, America's <laughs> premier spy agency, and in Southeast Asia, no less, in the middle of a world war, which instilled in her the discipline, the focus, and the hard work that would serve her ultimate achievements. After the war, Julia was lost again, just wayward. I felt I had particular and unique spiritual gifts, she wrote in her diary. I swore I wouldn't do the voice. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's too irresistible. You have to go for the voice once in a while. I, I felt that I had particular and unique spiritual gifts, she wrote in her diary, that I was meant for something and was like no one else. I found that going through her diary. I mean, what a, what a thing to find from this woman at such a young age. Unfortunately, she concluded, she was sadly ordinary, 
a word that oppressed her almost as a, much as another would later in life, vegetarian. <laughs> her marriage after the war to Paul Child made her happy, but like many women in the post-war era, she soon discovered that she wanted a greater outlook for her creativity than simply pleasing a man. So she floundered at what that outlook could be. Paul loved food and introduced Julia to fine French dining, but at that point, she couldn't so much as boil water. We all know that Julia eventually gravitated to cooking, how her real education came at Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, which at that time was mostly a training ground for housewives and short order cooks. In typical fashion, she demanded more than the school was willing to give her, which was the basics, nothing more. Not to an upstart, not to an upstart American, of course, or a woman. Julia defied the school's despotic headmistress, Madame Brassart, who treated Julia with typical French disdain. Well, to hell with her and her school, Julia fumed after failing her diploma exam. The main thing, of course, is that I know how to cook. And cook she did. She spent days on end cooking, months on end, working her way through the entire Escoffier repertoire. To learn how to chop onions properly, she chopped dozens a day. You all saw that scene in Julia and Julia where Stanley Tucci comes home, he walks into the kitchen, and he's blinded, all those tears, by that mountain of onions Julia's chopping. That's exactly the way that happened. She chopped hundreds of onions just to get the chop right, to understand that you, know, you, you, you pull your hand through, you don't chop down like that. She knew exactly what she wanted to do and how much work she had, had, she had to do to get there. Mastering, mastering, Julia's word. To learn how to roast a chicken properly, a meal that Julia considered the pinnacle of French cuisine. In, in her words, a juicy, brown, buttery, crisp-skinned, heavenly bird, she roasted 40, maybe 50, until she was satisfied with the result. That meant roasting them at different temperatures, with different trussing methods, in different positions, with different stuffings, massaging them lovingly with butter. I, I said we weren't going to get into the sex, but there it is. <laughs> she made roasters, broilers, fryers, squabs, capons, old hens and roosters, the entire who's who of chickendom. The chicken sisters, as you saw them here tonight. Things got even more complicated when she decided to write a cookbook. The audacity of her, French cuisine for Americans. So she turned her attention to the American market, wondering how cooks in the States could best roast the chicken at home. What type of chicken might one encounter at a supermarket? How could a consumer detect freezer burn or insipidness? Would it take longer or shorter cooking time with an electric oven? Her early notes were full of such concerns, and when I did most of my research over at the Schlesinger Library, uh, I, I saw scribbled in the margins of, of her, her notes all of these questions. She was relentless with questions. She had to know the answer to everything before she would commit that recipe to the printed page. How to defreeze the icebox best? What should a good chicken taste like? These were all questions that she asked. Julia, of course, also loved meat in all its guises. But before tackling any meat recipes, she bombarded the U.S. Department of Agriculture with letters to determine the various breeds of cattle, which cuts of beef were most suitable for which recipes, their individual fat content. The Department of Fisheries became a regular pen pal to Julia. She was that determined, that relentless. Her curiosity was unquenchable. It's not like today when would-be chefs slap something together with too many ingredients and believe it will elevate them to culinary rock stardom. Julia believed in paying her dues, learning technique, mastering, mastering, mastering. Now, you might know that I also wrote a book about the Beatles. Um, and like the Beatles, Julia had that extraordinary dedication to her passion that took her to the highest levels of achievement. I recognized that right away, all the parallels as I began researching Julia's life. The Beatles spent unending hours playing rock and roll in Liverpool and, and Hamburg, perfecting their craft. And that's exactly what Julia did in the kitchens of Paris, Marseille, Germany, Oslo, and of course right here in Cambridge. And like the early Beatles, like many who were ahead of their time, 
she suffered rejection. After seven years of researching and writing, Houghton Mifflin rejected her book, calling it brilliant, but too complicated for housewives. Then the editor, Judith Jones, also brilliant, and treated it like a reject at Knopf, my publisher, became her champion and turned what Julia called cook bookery on its head. Turns out Houghton Mifflin was wrong. American women really were up for the challenge. Um, now, here's the part of our story where Julia went from a person who wrote a notable book to a full-scale cultural force. And that, of course, is when she went on TV in, here in 1963. Through the force of her personality in the nascent television age, with her singular persona, her humor, her sparkle, and that voice, she became one of the very first television personalities that the public embraced for her genuineness and for her ideas. Julia didn't believe in prepackaged food, and Julia wasn't prepackaged herself. She didn't go in for media training to tone down that voice, and she didn't have a battalion of stylists. In fact, I think she wore the same three blouses for 30 years on TV. Uh, she washed them, but they were the same three blouses, take it from me. She set the stage for how to be a modern TV personality. She invented it. She didn't just come along and do a good job at something that already existed. Sure, there had been plenty of other performers before her, but Julia Child became a star just by being herself. She became wildly popular by tapping into something that women weren't doing at the time, but something that deep down they really wanted to do, which was to express themselves, to do something special. Women in the early 1960s had been told again and again, live your life the easy way, the quick way, the ordinary way. So at dinner, when all of a sudden they slapped down a duck a l'orange like Julia, instead of Mrs. Paul's fish sticks, like my mother, <laughs> women, found that people looking at, women found people looking at them, their families, in an, admir in an admiring new way. They felt fulfilled, opened up to a challenge well met. Now, the food scene has really evolved since Julia, and it's moved on. But it was Julia who lit the fuse, and the fireworks are really still going off today. We've moved beyond, the early, uh, beyond early Julia and beyond classic French cuisine. But then she was moving on, too, in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. She began to develop recipes based on different American dishes, and different ingredients, and to encourage chefs to express themselves, to be bold and inventive, and to step out from behind the stove and to take the bows. There are a lot of new food trends now, um, more than we'd like, I'm afraid. But the essence of good eating is still based on the uh, principles that Julia Child set forth. Quality ingredients, full-scale flavors, and appreciation of the full sensation of dining at its best. She showed us that there was poetry in eating, that food was a form of creativity and pleasure, not just fuel. Julia's life was a great adventure, take it from me. I spent these last four years in her thrall as I wrote episode after episode of her remarkable saga. Her exploits were as exciting and suspenseful as any heroines, as profound and enduring as our greatest pop heroes. Confronting her demise, she chose to greet it in a typically singular and brave fashion. Faced with a choice between extraordinary measures or certain death, she decided to simply take a nap, her phrase, to slip off the raft. I'm a grown man, <laughs> but I wept when I wrote that last scene of her passing. I thought of all it had taken for Julia to transform herself from, again, her words, someone ordinary into a fully realized woman and a cultural force. Afterwards, I realized I would never again get the chance to serve as her escort. But in the four years it took to write Deary, I realized finally that Julia was escorting me. Thank you very much. Now, usually uh, I know that people talk a little longer, and, um, and, and I could prattle on and on, let me assure you. But uh, I realized traveling across the country that um, people really feel they have a personal attachment to Julia. 
Uh, they feel like they know her because they spent years with her on TV, and of course many of you here met her. Uh, and, and a lot of you have questions, and, and somebody has to ask me about Dan Aykroyd, too. <laughs> uh, so I think it, it'll be a lot more fun than me just talking and talking. Uh, if you'd ask a few questions, uh, I hope I can answer them and tell you a few good stories. Oh, that, you know, that's, that's a great question. When I started my work over at the Schlesinger, they said, we have Julia's archives and we have some boxes here. Uh, there were 186 of them. <laughs> and I, I knew I was in for it after I'd spent two months, I got through the first box. Uh, it was dense. Uh, Julia kept everything she ever wrote including short stories when she was a little kid at, at her school. And if you sent Julia an invitation in 1936 for a luncheon in Pasadena, Julia kept the invitation and she tore the postmark off and clipped it to the, the letter so that she'd know the date and the time that she got it. So she was a great archivist. Um, she kept a diary when she was very young and she wrote uh, letters, but it wasn't it wasn't Julia's letters so much that really mesmerized me. It was Paul's letters. Um, Paul Child had a twin brother named Charlie, as many of you know. He went to Harvard. And uh, Paul decided that he would write Charlie a letter every day, beginning in 1938, till he was incapacitated in, in the late 70s. And these were not ordinary letters. These were eight, ten, 15, 20 pages of the most beautiful prose you've ever read on everything that was in his mind. The state of the world, his inability to sleep, uh, poetry, philosophy, he drew on them. Uh, my wife had to keep reminding me this is not a Paul Child biography. He is, was a fascinating man, so he provided for me all the other material for the book I got to really see how Julia was progressing from when he first met her um, as a woman he, he, who, whom he found, uh, how can I put this, let's see if I can remember it, um, he, he, he called her completely unsophisticated and, and not too much of an interesting mind, but I can't get over those legs. <laughs> <laughs> he loved Julia's legs. And then you can see as the letters progress how he realizes that there is a mind there, but it had never been properly sparked. And Paul lit that fuse. I mean, he really did. He sparked that, uh, that mind of Julia's, and she craved what he had. Um, she craved his intelligence, his sophistication, his erudition, his artistic ability. And together they, uh, excuse the expression, but they fed each other um, in, in the truest sense. I, I got off the subject there, but Julia, Julia had a lot of, a lot of writing. <laughs> she wrote diaries all her life. Actually, um, one of the drawbacks of my book, I will tell you, that I'm ha unhappy with is that I sourced almost every line in this book. Uh, there, was, there were 175 pages of notes. And unfortunately, we couldn't put them in the book. So uh, they're online. Um, it, it's not easy to do it that way. But it, otherwise, you would not have been able to afford this book. So unfortunately, we had to do it. Anyone else? As sharp as a tack. Yes, Julia was as sharp as a tack till, uh, till the day she died. And, and um, entertaining people and insisting on being entertained. Uh, she was in a wheelchair the last year and a half of her life and absolutely forbidden to go out and have dinner at good restaurants and drink wine. And yet almost four times a week, Julia found a way to be smuggled out of that nursing home. <laughs> and, um, and also the people who even smuggled her out knew, Julia, you can't have steak and wine. Sure enough, she found a way to have steak and, and a half a glass of wine. She was not going to compromise her taste. And that basically is why Julia who had the opportunity to live for another couple years, um, decided she wouldn't do it at the cost of not being able to taste food. It wasn't worth it to her. And she, um, and she really did go out on her own terms. She, she knew that if she didn't take her medicine, uh, she would not live longer than 24 hours. And she, she told her assistant, no, I'm dearie, I'm just going to go upstairs and I'm going to take a little nap. And that's exactly what she did. 
So, boy, I wish I could go out that way, you know? That's the way. At the age of 90, almost 92, three days shy. Let me first begin by saying that Ju Julia's father was um, more than a very uh, conservative Republican gentleman. He was a, um, a real staunch right-winger. Um, you know, this is, goes to the right of conservatism. And he was um, at odds with Julia her entire life. She had, when she was a young girl at the table, she listened to tirades uh, at the dinner table that were just short of uh, violence on FDR. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was invited to Pasadena and invited to the, Julia's house for dinner at one point, and the police knew that they had to watch her father because he was that violently opposed to, to the Roosevelts, so that never happened. Um, and I think Julia was smart enough at a very young age to see that, to understand that somehow this was reactionary. I don't know how she understood it, but it, it happened early on. And by the time she got to Smith, of course, she was starting to veer in the opposite direction. But of course, she went back to Pasadena afterwards, and that strong pull of her father's, and especially her father's desire for her to marry Harrison Chandler, at the Times, and the Times, the LA Times back then was a, a very right-leaning newspaper, uh, really tore her. Uh, she was at odds with her father her entire life. He never gave her an ounce of satisfaction. He never told her that he was proud of her. In fact, he wasn't proud of her. Um, she had married Paul. He hated the fact that she married Paul. This was a man who spoke French. Her father hated the French. He hated intellectuals, he said it. And yet this was a man who had gone to Princeton. Um, he despised um, fine food and, uh, and really never gave, even when Julia was on TV and he saw that she was a star, he was still alive. Uh, he never gave her the satisfaction of telling her that uh, he had approved. So it was really tough on her all her life. Uh, her independent thinking was, was somehow born in her. I think her mother was a fairly free spirit. Uh, her mother was one of those women who would la laugh at her husband and tease him a little and then go her own way. Uh, and I think Julia had some of that in her, and certainly her sister did as well. So uh, her brother, um, John, the middle child, uh, he went her father's way. He made her father happy. He asked, he said, we all knew how Julia played here in the United States. How did she play in France? Um, I think France was befuddled by Julia. Uh, befuddled even in the sense that I'll tell you, we're not going to get a French book sale on my book because they really don't know who she is. And yet she got the French Medal of Honor. Um, I think it was the Legion of Honor, right? Um, you know, she was an American. They, French food over there was to be made by Frenchmen. Uh, there were no women in their kitchens in France in those days, none. Uh, there were only women in the homes. In the, in the kitchen. So Julia being, uh, you know, a French uh, a television personality who promoted French cooking and, and classic Escoffier cuisine was kind of anomaly to the French people. Uh, she did actually go back to Le Cordon Bleu later on and, uh, and to the mate, hated Madame Brassard, um, who she, Julia really did despise. Julia didn't despise many people. Um, Madame Brassart was one, she always said. The other were, the other, there were three others, uh, Hitler and Senator McCarthy and Madeleine Kamen. <laughs> Do you know who Madeleine Kamen is? Yeah, a great, a really a wonderful French cooking teacher. Julie and Madeleine, they never got along their entire lives. <laughs> so she lumped her in there with Hitler and uh, <laughs> Senator McCarthy. <laughs> um, so I hope I answered your question, but you know, I, I don't think they really understood that a woman would, you know, it's for men to do in France and in the kitchens. I, I think it's changing a bit. Why did she move out west? Yes, it is because of her health, but also, even though Julia loved being here in Cambridge, Julia was always a California girl at heart. It was in her bones. Um, and when you talk to her, and, and, and I did talk to her about it a lot, you really understood. This was a beach, she was loved growing up on the beach. 
uh, and, and playing golf and being on the hockey, you know, out on the polo fields. And uh, that was another side of Julia that the people here really didn't know. But she couldn't wait. She loved being here, but she couldn't wait to get back to uh, California. It began there, and it was going to end there. And I think she always had that uh, in mind. Julia did not have children. One of the real regrets in her life, I saw it in her letters, I'll tell you, toward the end of her life, she wrote to uh, Simca, her cooking partner, Simone Beck. Um, I think when they were like 84, Simca was just about to fail. And she said, isn't it a shame that neither of us ever had children? They, we both wanted children. Um, she, she, Julia had a very close family of nieces and nephews, a big one. Uh, they were very close to, to her, and to this day, they remain close to the Julia Child Foundation. Her niece, Phyla, is the head of the Julia Child Foundation, and there, next week, there's a big symposium at, uh, at Harvard, at Radcliffe, uh, and Phyla is chairing it, and I'm going to be there as well. So it's, um, you know, Julia was a great aunt. She, those kids loved her. It was Paul they were scared of. He was a pretty prickly guy. Um, you know, he was not Stanley Tucci. <laughs> um, and and they, were, they were afraid of him, actually. Um, he was, Paul had, um, before he met Julia, he had been a proctor at an all-boys school. And he had had kids up to here. And when he met Julia, of course, when they got married, he was 50 and she was 40. And at 50, Paul didn't want any kids around, so they weren't having kids. But uh, they had a, long, uh, a large family, and they're very close. Uh, she said she heard that when Julia Child uh, invited people for dinner, or, to, or to, when she entertained, that people got really excited uh, about cooking, and that Julia really didn't make fancy food. Well, there are a few stories I can tell you here. <laughs> you know what Julia served as hors d'oeuvres all the time? Does anybody know? Uh, Goldfish, Pepperidge Farm goldfish. <laughs> she loved them. She ate them by the bowl fill, and she ate them for her through her entire life. If you got invited to lunch at Julia's, you got a tuna fish sandwich, and it was you know chicken of the sea, some mayonnaise. Uh, that's what Julia made. And and I was told a really funny story by the Boston Globe food editor, um, who said she got invited to Julia's house for dinner. And it was a big party. Julia had lots of people come all the time, uh, maybe four or five times a week. Because anyone who came through here, and all the chefs from Boston, and anybody who just happened to drop by got a dinner invitation. So um, <laughs> uh, Julia never cooked. You cooked while Julia told you what to do. <laughs> but, but when Julia did cook, She'd cook a roast chicken. Now, on this particular night that um, I was told the story by the, the Boston Globe food editor, she said that, um, she said, I was sitting there and there were eight people at the table. And Julia was making roast chicken. This was great. She could smell it. It smelled really good. So, you know, she brings the first one out and it's a little three pound roaster. And she said, and the woman said to me, now, you know, I'm Jewish. I know there's eight more chickens coming out of that oven. <laughs> oh, there weren't. It was that one chicken. And everybody got like a little thimble full on their plate and a little Brussels sprout, and that was dinner. So, you know, Julia, Julia believed, I, I asked her once, Julia, how, you, how do you keep so trim? When we were traveling, you know, we'd eat all this fantastic food, and uh, she was, you know, she, her figure was pretty good all through her life. She was big, but she was trim. And she said, oh, you know, I have a, I have a really good uh, uh, formula. And she showed me. Well, she made a great ceremony out of it. She said, uh, she showed me her plate. And she said, you know, I, I, she drew a line down the middle. And she said, I only eat half. And so she ate the first half. And when she was done, she ate the second half, too. <laughs> <laughs> but Julia believed, Julia believed, and, and this is why she stayed trim. She believed you could eat whatever you want in moderation. And she lived by that credo. She, it always disappointed her when people said, Julia, you know, you cook with so much butter. Uh, how, can anybody, how can anybody exist that way? And she'd go, moderation. You know, she didn't make big proportions. She made, you know, well, not just those thimblefuls of chicken. But when Julia cooked a dinner for her and Paul, they didn't eat gargantuan 
meals, and they didn't have 48-ounce, you know, sodas. Um, she, she cooked in moderation. I once saw when someone asked her, Julia, uh, you know, you use all of that butter, and, and I can't do that. And Julia goes, oh, no problem, dearie. Just substitute cream. <laughs> Oh, I'm glad you asked this, because I've been dying to tell you this. Um, Julia Child did not like Italian food. <laughs> and here's why. And it happened almost every night. Every night they would put our meal in front of us. And, you know, I love Italian food. And Julia would go, oh, no. You know, she said, it's the same sauce. She couldn't get over the fact that the Italians ate uh, sauce their meals with, you know, olive oil, garlic, onions, uh, and tomatoes. She just couldn't get past that. She used to say, you know, you go to France and they make a hundred sauces. They're artistic masterpieces. She found Italian food boring. And as much as I tried to say, Julie, you know, this is really great stuff, she couldn't, she just couldn't brook it. And we had our own problems in Italy. You know, here, Julia was a celebrity. And, and if you ever ate dinner with Julia here, the first thing she'd do when she'd go into a restaurant is she would cut right through the tables, march back into the kitchen, and talk to the chef, and, you know, put her finger in the sauce and lick it, and try pick up something out of a roasting pan and try it. And so we did that in, in Italy, too. Now, they had no idea who this big, lumbering woman was coming into their kitchen and, and dipping her big paw into their, their saucepan. And we got murderous stares from those Italian chefs. Uh, we, I, and, and I think they did something to the food once or twice to Julia, too. They paid her back. Um, she loved Lydia Bastianic because she was a really good friend of hers. And she loved the way Lydia taught cooking and her whole approach to cooking. And she thought Lydia's food looked good, but Julia just wouldn't buy the Italian food. She just wouldn't do it. You know, I found a different Julia Child when I met her. Um, I found a woman who understood her appeal and understood and protected her brand, but she was also dead serious about cooking. She really was. And I think it's one of the reasons that she didn't, um, she didn't hit it off with Julie Powell, because um, they did meet. And Julia, uh, I think Julia really was rooting for this woman hey, look, here was somebody who was cooking through Mastering the Arts. And if you've ever cooked from that book, you know it ain't easy. Um, but she met somebody who she felt wasn't respectful about the way she approached food. And that Julia couldn't tolerate. And that was a different side of Julia that I saw. Um, yes, she was everything that you saw. She loved her audience. She was a very warm woman. She was incredibly witty and had a dark side about her wit, um, and very romantic. She had a, she loved young men. In fact, I'll tell you a little story that's in the book. I'll tell you a little story that's in the book that her niece told me. When Julia was quite sick, and she was in Santa Barbara, she was, uh, she had just turned 91, uh, Phyla took her to the movies. Julia loved going to the movies. And her voice would cut through the theater because she'd just talk out loud, you know. <laughs> and they went to see um, Troy. And w at a very quiet moment in the theater, Julia's voice quite loudly said, that Brad Pitt is an incredibly good-looking young boy. I wonder what's under that toga. <laughs> yeah. Yes. She, um, so she was all of those things, um, and she loved to play practical jokes on people, especially on the air. She knew that she was funny on TV, and she played to that. But she was as serious as they come. And it, it had to do when it came to food. She knew how important a role she had in bringing food to the American market and she took it very seriously so that was a side of her that that I had never seen before that I really appreciated and it was a side that I always kept in my 
in my ear, that voice, that part of her voice as I was writing this book. I wanted you to know that, yes, Joy is that lovable teacher and part clown we saw on TV, but when it, Joy always saw herself as a cooking teacher first. The personality, uh, the cook, everything else came afterwards. She was a cooking teacher. So yeah, that was a great, uh, great part of her. Now I will tell you about Dan Aykroyd. Thank you for asking, with no prompting. Um, I, had, I had the extreme pleasure of talking to Dan about it. He never knew that Julia loved his parody, and boy did she love it. She had, Julia didn't like parodies of herself, because the first thing everybody did when they did a parody of hers, they went for the voice. And Julia Child did not think she had a funny voice. Um, so she wasn't really looking forward to seeing this when they gave it to her. And she split her sides laughing. She had that video cassette, and she showed it for everybody who came to her house for years afterwards. And then she would reenact it in her kitchen. <laughs> she would go, save the liver, and she'd fall over the counter, and she'd crack up laughing. And she liked it because it was, it was dark. You know, it was, it was not the usual Julia Child take. She really enjoyed it. Um, Dan never knew that, and he was really happy because um, his aunt, he told me, was considered to be the Julia Child of Canada, his aunt Helen. And so he grew up eating great French food, and he watched his aunt on TV, and he, he watched uh, Julia with his aunt. So he felt really close to her doing that. And that script, by the way, for that Dan Aykroyd piece on Saturday Night Live was written by Senator, then now Senator Al Franken, who was sitting under the table with a fire extinguisher pumping blood up through Dan's arm. <laughs> so it had, a, it had a very celebrated cast in, in that. Was Jacques Pepin? She met Jacques Pepin very early in her life. Um, he was a student at Columbia when she met him. And then she kind of followed his career all throughout. And she knew that he, she knew he was a good, a good cook because she knew he had apprenticed for a long time and that he had really done the hard work. And of course, you know, Jacques was the executive chef, I don't know if you know this, with Pierre Fernet at uh, Howard Johnson's of all places. But his food was really good there. And so she knew him for a long time. Then um, she was introduced to Jacques at the, uh, reintroduced to him here in Boston at Metropolitan College at, at BU, where they developed their Julia and Jacques cooking. And you know, I, I think that Jacques um, really added about 10 years to Julia's life. They said, oh, don't drag an old lady across the TV screen. You know, she's too old. Don't put her on TV again. She, she had a blast with Jock. And um, when you read the book, you'll see the, the whole, I guess, second to last chapter is the behind the scenes of that show, which were hysterical. They both tried to sabotage each other all the time. <laughs> Julia, Jock would say, no, no, don't, we're not going to use any salt in that. And he'd go to get something else, and Julia would be putting the salt in the <laughs> recipe. Um, and they, they fought like cats and dogs through that, but they really loved each other. And that was a really funny, funny part of her life. And she, of course, you know, she knew his name was Jock, but she kept calling him Jack. Because um, she knew it pissed him off. <laughs> she was great. Julia was a great woman. Anyway, thank you so much for coming tonight, and I really um, hope you had a good time.